Hey, welcome to Paper and Napkin Wisdom. James, James Ashcroft and I are doing something very new. So this is part of, in this next season of Paper and Napkin Wisdom, we've got a number of different things. And, I, I, and, and for those of you who listen to the podcast and have been listening for a while, you know that I love to read. I really love to read. And, and over my, my travels, I've met many people who enjoy a good book. Uh, few enjoy them as frequently as I do, and few enjoy them more frequently than I do. And James is one of those people in the latter group that really reads a lot of books. And I think sometimes I think you read more than I do, which is amazing. James, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Go. I appreciate it. So that while this is on Paper and Acting Wisdom, this is really going to be something that James and I do together. We're going to come together and we're going to build a rhythm for this. So if you like what you're hearing in this episode, I would like you to share it and tweet it and let us know that you love it so that we'll do more of them. But we're going to come together on a rhythm and we're going to talk about some books. And you know, we're not going to do that high level, superficial crap that you hear mostly when we talk about books, right, James? We're going to dig a lot deeper. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Going to get a hand study here. Yeah, so we're going to really dig into the book, uh, and, and we're going to pick different books, books that, you know, we're going to do some fiction, we're going to do some nonfiction, we're going to go all over the map and really sort of explore books that we love, and maybe even some books that we don't like so much. Sure, it's going to happen from time to time, right? Yeah, and hopefully some books that we might disagree on, but I, I don't think this is going to be one of them. So this is, when, when James, James and I were sitting in the back of a room um, in fact, in, in a session that I mostly run, but I was in a bit of a break and we were talking in that break and you suggested this book, right? I, I did. You know, this is one of these books where, um, you know, sometimes when I'm running and such, I, I, I grab some books and listen to them on Audible. But uh, I got in the first chapter of this book and I thought, oh man, this is going to be one I need to highlight. I need to revisit. So I uh, kind of shelved the Audible idea. Yeah, and, and Audible isn't reading, right? Like, let's be clear about this. Audible is not reading. It's, it's very passive. There's no doubt about it. I know, and I know you're a big believer in focus and there is a, an element of training that it comes to reading, right? So you got to focus and, and, and kind of uh, uh, build that focus muscle. And I completely agree with you. Um, so uh, to your point, you know, I really wanted to focus on this book and, and read it and take notes. And it's been a great, great uh, story so far. So. Yeah, and this is a great book, right? I mean, one of the, this is one of those books that, for me, that I, I, I really needed to be deliberate about taking notes during it. Uh, if this was an actual paper book for me, I mean, I took most of my notes on my Kindle version, which is what I like to do, so I have it with me all the time. I know you do it a little bit differently. I, I, well, actually, I do. I do the Kindle, and then what I do is I get my highlights, and I go to the Amazon store, and then I print the uh, notes out as a PDF. So, oh, that's awesome. All right. Yeah. So we're doing essentially the same thing. Yeah. But I love having the portability of those notes with me because I like to go back and think about those things, you know, weeks later. And in this case of this book, not just because we were doing this, James, but because this book really spoke to my soul. I read it twice before, right. before we came to this. And I told you that before we started. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just to be clear, I don't think we've you know, named the book yet, have we? No, so we haven't. I was, that was sort of like the pregnant pause, like a really <laughs> pregnant pause. Really, 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 what was the book, James? What did you suggest? We're building anticipation there. Yeah. So it, it's called uh, Eleven Rings, and it's done by, uh, written by the um, coach of uh, the Chicago Bulls and the LA Lakers, Phil Jackson. Uh, and just to you know, qualify this a bit, I'm not a basketball fan by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I did, uh, did like what I read on the sleeve, and anyone who's won 11 championships uh, in their field uh, is someone I want to take some notes from. So, um, you know, I love those, these, these sports books, you know, that Bill Walsh's book, this is now Phil Jackson's book. Uh, there's a book about, um, you know, Bill Belichick that I just read. It's amazing that notes you, the, the lessons you garner from, uh, from coaches at the highest level of sports, so just things you can directly apply to your personal and professional life. So, yeah. So, you know, one of the things I read is, so immediately you said, Hey, what about 11 rings? And, you know, I, I think, that uh, I am as much a basketball fan as you are. Yeah. <laughs> not, as you say, not very much. This isn't a hockey book, is it? Yeah, it's not a hockey <laughs> book. Uh, and, and even then, I don't read a lot of hockey books because, I, I, you know, the formula isn't there for me. But, the, but this, this had me from the cover. Yeah. And in, in the, the small title under 11 rings was The Soul of Success. And I was like, what is this book about? Like, what right. is it really about? And this was a real page turner for me. Like, I mean, as a book about basketball, it was, 
incredibly captivating early on because it wasn't about basketball at all. It was not. It, it's a leadership book. It's a leadership for yourself and it's a leadership for um, any team endeavor. Uh, the philosophies about how to run one's life. And it's just, uh, just a, I've, I had the same experience, just a complete page turner uh, for it, me. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I think that Phil is really great about and very vulnerable about throughout the book is sharing his journey as he explored his own soul. And that's what it was. I mean, this, the story, I, I became increasingly disinterested in the basketball story. Correct. And, and I wonder if that was part of the story arc, now thinking about it, because there was a point in the middle where the basketball story sort of got a little bit interesting. And yeah. then I just really didn't care anymore. Like, I didn't want to hear about it. I wanted to hear about what was going on with Phil. Yeah, it, it was almost like a repetition of the same buildup, you know, to the championship teams, the same, the same kind of story arc on the basketball side. So it did. I got, got a bit, you know, less interested in that. But just to see him progress from that basketball player to the assistant coach, to the coach, and everything he learned about leading. Um, I actually wrote down a couple of uh, words here that popped out of me in my notes that, that kind of give a tone for, for the book that he's writing. These are words that he used several times. So he used words such as compassion, bonding, love, connection, warriors, transformation, human spirit, harmony, oneness, meaning, relaxation, honesty, meditation. I mean, this is, this is what this guy is about. Um, you know, it, it is, is running his life with these um, systems in place almost of, of soul. So I guess that's why his, his book has a soul for success, you know? It's uh, leading, and he, he has this great title of one of the chapters, you know, leading from the inside out. Yeah. So that, that, that really hit me because it wasn't, so I really reflected on it. I would, you could argue you could interchange the word the with there, right? Lead from there inside out. So that's his philosophy. It's taking these athletes with tremendous egos and pulling out their um, potential and providing a team structure so they can be so creative. Um, and then that bond that forms between those players, that's the, the recipe for success. So it's just fascinating to me that how he built up each individual player to create these teams. So. So whether it was basketball, it could have been football, it could have been hockey, it could have been any management book, to be honest with you. It could have been a story about any company, culture. You know, it's just, just incredible. Yeah, and he didn't try to make it more than it was. Like, I think one of the things that was really neat about the book for me uh, also was that he didn't try to be more than a basketball coach. Like, he didn't try to be a preacher. He didn't try to, to be more than he was. He just wanted to be a coach. He, he loved the relationship with the men that he was helping grow. And he loved the contribution he was making to them. He, he really got off on watching these young men become men, become a team, become something bigger than just themselves. And, and you know, I, and I should have known how deep this book was gonna go right from the opening quote, right? He quotes Rumi, right? So right Wait. away, we got yeah. a basketball coach, yeah. middle America, quoting Rumi, when you do things from your soul, you feel a river moving in you, a joy. Yes. And this yes, is what this whole book is about. It's, it, it is. And joy is such a great word, right? I mean, this guy clearly had a joy. I mean, how many times in the book does he walk away only to come back, you know? And it's, you know, it, 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 you know, it, it's just amazing to me that, um, well, it's not amazing. It's, it, it's an inspirational that someone just finds that river of joy within themselves to say, listen, I'm, what, what, I'm, what I'm best at, what my calling is, is to extract the best potential out of these young men uh, in a team environment, on the you know, strict structure of the NBA, of the basketball game. Um, and, and just that congruence is extremely powerful, you know? I mean, there's just so many great quotes in here. I mean, you could go on and on, I'm sure, from your notes, you know? Yeah, um, like early on, you know, one of the things that I think was really neat, by like calling it 11 rings, um, which, which really felt like at the beginning a very – arrogant ego play like i'm the greatest nba coach ever uh i have 11 rings nine as a coach of course and and two as a player but and one that he didn't earn as a player then he said the, the second one that he really earned but then he talked about how the ring as a symbol was such an important thing right that oh. ring of a symbol that's it and to him it was a circle of love right that was yes. like 
boom. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. We're totally on the same page here, Gavin. It's ridiculous. You know, I mean, I've got, I've got that whole section highlighted here. He, what he's, you know, um, what he said in, in that, um, in those paragraphs was, what was our motto on this team? It was the ring. I said, flash to my ring from the last championship we won in 2002. The ring, that was the motto. It's not just a band of gold. It's the circle that's made a bond between all these players, a great love for one another, the circle of love. So that's, that's it, it's not about, you know, the championship, the glitz and everything. It's about him stepping outside of himself and, and saying, my calling is to get these people into the circle of love, which yields such amazing results. It's, yeah, it's not coming back. This is like this mysterious alchemy that joins yes. players together, right? I mean, yes, yes, the, yes. I, I just, that whole, like, I, think I, I think I even texted you after. Yes, uh, you did, you this. did. Oh my yeah. God, what is this book? It's so great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what is this book? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, going back to our conversation, it's like, what is this book? Is it a basketball book? Is it a leadership book? Is it a biography? Is it, you know, it's all these great, great, it's really what you want it to be. You know, you can totally look at it as if you were getting into the coaching profession. It's like, they say, hey, this is a blueprint for how to win championships. If you're just uh, a layman, not interested in sports, want to learn about leadership, you know, um, it, it's got a million different uh, leadership um, lessons here. You know, it's just, and it's, it's just a great like every page, right? Like the next yeah. page talks about the great work that Sebastian Junger did um, as, as a journalist embedding himself in a platoon, right? And, yes. and he wrote this in, a, in Afghanistan. And he talks about the, why soldiers go into war. Right. right. What is it? Is it, for, is it for country? Is it for duty? Is it for whatever? And, and, and the, the answer that stuck with Phil Jackson was that the soldier replied, because I love my brothers. I mean, it's a brotherhood. Being able to save their life so they can live, I think is rewarding. The and ultimate teammate, right? Right. Yeah, the ultimate teammate, you know? Yeah, um, it, yeah. And, and I think that that whole uh, narrative there was saying, for the, you know, those pl platoons or whatever just have this amazing culture of bonding these guys together, which is no different from what he was instilling in his teams, you know? Um, it's, it's, it's great, man. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. I love the, the stages. Uh, you know, he talks about the stages of a group and from stage one group yes. to a stage five group. And this, and he refers back to that over and over. And what he's really referring to is this book called tribal leadership, which I don't know if you've read yet. I have not, no. But great book uh, about how tribes are formed, sizes of tribes that work well. And, you know, some, some, there's some research around it and some of which I find interesting and some of which I think a little, uh, a little bit of a stretch. But I'd forgotten about these stages until I read them. And this is very paraphrased in, in, in Phil Jackson's book. But Phil talks about stage one being most street gangs characterized by despair, hostility, and the collective belief that life sucks. And it moves all the way to stage five, which is a rare stage characterized by a sense of innocent wonder and the strong belief that life is great, right? So you have these things on the poles and then various types of stages of tribes in between and their, their efficacy, their ability to achieve is in his belief and his experience very closely tied to what stage they achieve right right absolutely you know um and he was, he was very quick to identify um the teams that he took over too so it became almost like a, he he bought into this tribal stages very effectively you know he i think it was the lakers later on he said you know this is clearly a tribe three team you know, I got to get them to four as quickly as possible so then he actually you know started implementing different kind of practices in meditation circles or, or whatever it was do, doing during that time to try, you know, to, to help them get from a stage three to a stage four to get build those championship teams at stage five. So he's very, very clear and, and deliberate. In, yeah. In, and stage three is characterized by this notion that I'm great and you're not. Right. And this, they, which, would, which was kind of the LA Lakers. Thing. Yes. As opposed to the stage four team, which is we're great and they're not. Yes. Which is a tribal pride and conviction the bigger the foe, foe, the more powerful we are. And trans five, stage five is transcendent. In his, in his time, he says he's only ever had one team that achieved stage five. Yeah. Which was the 95, 98 bulls in that stretch. 
Yeah. They, they were just transcendent of everything else. That yes. life is great. This is fun. Let's be ourselves. Yes. Unbelievable. Yeah. Really cool. I mean, those go, those teams go down as the, the greatest of all time, clearly, you know? So, clearly. Yeah. clearly. Uh, and he talks a lot about brotherhood, right? I mean, the, this notion of it being a brotherhood. Yeah. And I think it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, brotherhood. So it's, I mean, he mentions that the lot of players have the ability to be superstars with their own potential, right? They're, they're clearly uh, very talented. They've got everything it takes to win. Um, but he, in his mind, the true superstars are those who enable their teammates to rise up to their own potential uh, as a group, as a team, you know? So uh, um, it's, it, I just found that absolutely fascinating, you know? Um, let me just share with you, uh, Govan, the, the, um, the one thing on those lines that really stuck out to me was what he learned over the years is that the most effective approach is to delegate authority as much as possible and to nurture everyone else's leadership skills as well. When I'm able to do that, it not only builds team unity and allows others to grow, but also paradoxically strengthens my role as leader. Yeah. So, so you know, it's, it's a win-win. It's, it, it's the greatest education system and, and team building to, 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 to allow others um, to take responsibility to grow creatively in a structure and at the same time become a stronger leader yourself. Very powerful stuff. Yeah, re really powerful. And I think one of the things that I think was really interesting about it throughout was he didn't always claim to have the right answer, right? I mean, I think he was pretty open about the fact that he did, you know, they did solve things as, as a team. And I think what was also really interesting about the stage four teams and the stage five teams that he had, which would be the Lakers and their, and their stretch and the, and the two bull stretches, the one where they were stage five and the other time that they were stage four. But in each of those cases, I thought what was really interesting is the superstar was also never alone. Like as great as Jordan was, he had Pippen, right? Yes. As great as Shaq was, he had Kobe or vice versa, right? Right. That, that there was always this, that any even within the elite structure of the leadership within the team, it take it took two personas to be able to lead those teams forward, plus the coach. Yeah, and I think I think Phil's um, teaching allowed that to happen because I think in a different coaching situation, you would have had a Michael Jordan whose maybe ego would have gotten so out of control that he didn't allow you you know, a second to rise up. And I think that was the beauty of Phil and Michael Jordan's relationship is that they, they learn from each other. And, uh, and, and clearly, you know, Jordan's um, praise of Phil touched his, his heart because, you know, he kind of put his own ego um, back on the shelf a bit. And that allowed Scotty to step up and take that real supportive role that then in turn allowed Jordan to kind of transcend into this great, great, I mean, beast of a player, you know, it, it truly did take a team, you know? Yeah. You know, he, he, it, one of the things that he talked about and you talked about leading from the inside out and then there was edging the ego and then the, and then, then he talked about let each player discover his own destiny. And in that section, uh, he actually quotes Jordan saying that he called it the team's collective think power. Yes. That was the, that was the hallmark of their success. Yes, absolutely. And this collective ability to think. I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, we're, we're talking about the greatest player that ever played the game saying, no, the, the reason why we won is because we had the team's collective ability to think together. Right, right. Absolutely. I mean, it's the, you know, this, the, the, uh, the team coming together. I mean, these, these aren't just like winning great games. These are winning year after year with teams full of elite ta talent. I mean, you, you have to separate yourself above and beyond. And that's the transcendence that, that we witness, you know, reading, reading Phil's uh, coaching style and, and um, philosophies. Unbelievable. Yeah. And I also loved, uh, you know, one of the things that I love as a mantra is structure sets you free. And he, he talked about that a lot, but he goes even further to call it into turning the mundane into the sacred. But he talks about the, the, the mundane day-to-day -day practicing, he made it sacred. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of yeah. the minds. And, and it, it, is, it, it is like that, it is like to that above. So, so the idea again is this notion that when we, when we commit to this higher sense of self, 
self-discipline, collective discipline, or whatever it is to each other, we can achieve way, much, way, way more. And, you know, he's not, he's not a religious guy. He was brought up very religious in his family, but not a religious guy. And he went on his own journey and became very spiritual. And he, and he, he believed that teaching that spirituality to his men was, a, was part of his job. Like, in fact, the biggest part of his job. Absolutely. I mean, you know, he, he was uh, going to be a kama preacher at one point, right? So he definitely had that whole um, teaching sensibilities to him. Um, but you're right about the mundane, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the great quotes in the book is that you know, practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice does, you know? Yeah. So I think he just touched on every component of, of, of practice, of execution during game times, uh, and, and really was a, a, a preacher of sorts, but in a very quiet way. Um, uh, a very different way than most coaches were. You know, a lot of coaches, um, you know, talk about leadership by driving people. You know, he was more of just kind of harness the energy and help help get them there uh, instead of being the, the hard tasking leader, you know, um, which is just fascinating to me. Yeah, and he, he, he really created a lot of space for his teams to figure it out, right? I mean, he would let things fall. He would say, Absolutely. you know, he, yeah. he did not believe in – calling plays from the bench. He believed in what are we going to do? How are we going to solve it? Trusting your team so that they could trust themselves and grow. That was really important to him. And more than anything else, I mean, if anything, like you say, that you said so many times that this is a philosophical book, he talks about Zen teachings. You know, Suzuki is, 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 top, is quoted, I think, as much or more than anybody yeah. else in the entire book, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, he just going back to, you know, not teaching, um, not teaching from the sidelines or, or, or calling plays. Um, he, he was often criticized for that not being emotional enough, but he was, ve- he's a very big proponent of within that team structure to let the individuals create. So they get themselves into these positions. He lets them figure out how they're going to get themselves out of these jams. He's there as a counsel if he needs to. I mean, he, he'll take over if he needs to, but for the most part, he entrusts, he puts a, a tremendous amount of trust into his teammates, even at huge levels of game four of the NBA finals, you know, two seconds ago, they're calling their own plays and figuring it out because he set up practice and the whole culture to work together as a team. It's in the collective mind that you referenced that how are we going to get out of this? How are we going to score the next three points in two seconds? And, and, uh, and, and it works. It works. You know, if you're allowing uh, your team um, to make these decisions and empowering them, um, I think it's pretty uh, easy to, to think that people want to succeed. So they're going to put all their resources into it. These guys got together, big egos, put them aside and said, hey, let's pass it to so-and-so. Who, they won't be expecting it. We don't need Michael Jordan or Kobe to, to make that game-winning shot. Who's going to be open? Let's give them the ball and let's win this game as a team. Yeah, and he, you know, the theme of, uh, to me, one of the themes that came up over and over and over again were, was his compassion to all people. I mean, he was so loving towards Dennis Rodman and recognizing, you know, he never had, this is my style of leadership. It will apply to everyone. You have to move to my style. It was, he bent and moved to everyone else around him. And he recognized that, you know, with certain people, he needed to hit them hard and other people, he needed to be very measured and very careful about how he reacted. And Rodman was one of those people that he had to be very careful about how he reacted because every emotion he showed, Rodman showed 10 times as higher. Yeah, and Rodman wore his emotions on his sleeve and he would easily tune out if, if um, you know, he wasn't feeling the love, you know? So, so Phil recognized that. Um, you know, um, towards the end of the book, he had a great, you know, just a couple of sentences. He says, my goal, referencing being a coach, has always been to foster an environment where the players can grow as individuals and express themselves creatively within a team structure. And I think that is, I mean, you can, you can say whether it's a coach, whether it's a leader, whether it's a father, you know, husband, whatever, um, you, you can apply these messages. A friend, right? I mean, isn't that what we want to achieve in friendship? Isn't that as friends, don't we want to achieve that with each other and for each other? Absolutely. And, you know, you want about, and it's people, this simplicity, patience, compassion. It comes up over and over and over and over all the way through this. And this is a coach who's like, let's talk to our championships. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. You know, and because I think what, what fascinated me so much was just to, you know, you read these management books 
about culture and things, and it's so great. But this is someone leading just the biggest egos. I mean, truly leading leaders, right? I mean, these guys, if they had it their way, every player in the NBA, you know, has a lot of talent. They have, a, you know, come from where they've been, you know, the, the all-star in high school, probably since middle school, let's be honest, you know. They get, you know, uh, when they're praised because of their elite talent, they come into, these, into the NBA. And, um, and having, having that kind of success on those levels, to me, was just absolutely incredible, you know. And, and he created these conclaves where they could just be themselves and be yes. together, right? And he didn't call them conclaves, but he called, you know, practices were sacred ground. Yes. You know, th there were these sacred places where they could just be themselves. And one of the things that I just freaking loved, uh, again, you're going from the end, but even still going, jumping back to the beginning, but really tied to what you said, was he talked about how being fixated on winning or more likely not losing is counterproductive, especially when it causes you to lose control of your emotion. What's more, obsessing about winning is a loser's game. The most we can hope for is to create the best possible conditions for success and let go of yes. the outcome. Like let go of the outcome. Just yes. brilliant. Like I, I read that and I just stopped. Yeah. I, I, that's a powerful, powerful, amazing idea it really is it, it, it's letting go and that just ties in perfectly to the you know the philosophies and the meditation and you know meditation is all about letting go right so you just create these structured practices those environments those sacred spaces you know their meditation circles they did you know right before game five to get their their mind straight as he says you know you you, you know so when you create these environments i think that's where he was coming from the game you know, a minute to go in the game, the game's closed, and he's just sitting on the bench not saying a word. You know, the TV cameras are zooming in saying, what's Phil, why, why is he so, you know, just quiet over there? What's wrong with him? He should be on the, you know, running the sidelines, screaming at everyone. they got to get their act together, you know? No, he's, he let go at that point. He'd done everything to provide a circle of success for, this, for these players, for this team. And it was time to let go and let the outcome happen as it was meant to happen. Yeah. And, and he would even say that sometimes after these, these big wins, and predictably the next game, we got destroyed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and he's like, he, would, he, he could see it coming before they even went to the game. And right. He, and he, he thought that was just part of the roller coaster, and it was part of the, part of the fun of it. And I thought that he, but one of the things that I thought was really interesting too was how closely he cared for his mentors. Like he talked earlier on um, about Red. Uh, I can't oh, remember his name awesome. right now, but Goldsman. Yeah, yeah, his his yeah. his coach, right? Yes. He talked about how in, when he was when he earned his first ring, he earned it on the bench as an injured player, and they gave him a full share and a ring, even though he spent most of the season injured. But he actually served as Red's assistant that year, and one time he quoted something that he thought was quotable, and Red was you know didn't care about it. And he just looked at him and said, don't you realize these papers are going to be lining someone's birdcage tomorrow? I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I think it was just like he held his mentors in such high esteem and he stayed connected with them all the way through his career. It was interesting that, you know, he, he brought a lot of the same characters along with him as, as he went, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, 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 you're absolutely right. You know, he modeled the masters. He took the best components of all the teachings that he did and then just rolled it up into Phil Jackson style philosophy um, that, that ended up being the, the coach that he turned out to be. Um, you, you, you definitely tell throughout the book, he had a lot of um, gratitude to, to the people that he was surrounding himself with, you know, and I think maybe even downplaying it, you know, um, clearly knew how to be around the right people you know, clearly gravitated towards the right owners of the NBA, uh, in turn got, you know, around the right talent, you know? So I think he's downplaying that a bit in the book, you know, it's kind of, Oh, I just kind of started, I got a phone call and they said to come back, would I be interested? And I think he knew what he was doing. You know? Yeah. I'm pretty sure he did. You know, yeah. He talks about finding out. I, I love, I love the, the quip that he was in Alaska with his family on a vacation and an Inuit child came to him and said, yes, gosh, so perfect. Phil Jackson, you just signed with the Lakers. He's like, oh, really? Did I? 
But yeah, then he confesses later just, on that no, he had empowered his agent to do that negotiation. Yeah, yeah, but it was it was cool. it, yeah, it was clearly throwing out a movie idea there or something, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, but it was uh, it, listen, it, but it all kind of it, it is believable at the same time, you know, that that could happen to Phil Jackson, you know. I mean, his his a deadhead coach, you know, uh, Zen master um, who's into harmony, peace, oneness. I'm winning championships, so it, it wouldn't surprise me if it was in the middle of Alaska getting uh, getting notices by smoke signal. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, okay, you're a great musician. You love music. Uh, midway, you know, sort of halfway through the first act of the book, in the first section of the book, he starts talking about jazz and and Coltrane playing on on Miles Davis's band. And one time, apparently, Coltrane legendarily just went off. And, and played this ridiculous solo that made Miles furious. Right. And and Coltrane sort of quips, hey man, hey man, my axe wouldn't stop, brother. It just kept on going. And and then, you know, he says it a little more profanely, but he says, well then put the motherfucker down. Like yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And and then he and then there were these these sort of Thelonious monks set down these 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 pieces of advice. And and one of them was uh, play the melody, play part of the drum. You have to keep time, and you got to dig it to dig it. Do you dig yeah. it? Like I love that line. It was like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dig it to you dig it. I love it too. Yeah, yeah, he's great. You know, don't. It was a Charlie Parker had that quote. Don't play the saxophone. Let it play you. Yeah, you know. I mean, he, he's such an interesting guy. I could go on and on. You know? Yeah, but one of the things that was also interesting that is that he borrowed from other philosophies. So that music thing was interesting to me because he borrowed from other philosophies to help his teams. And the music segue was he, he had his teams coordinate their actions in four, four time. Right. So when they were, when they were like one, two, three, four, when they were behaving in that way, then the whole team was able to synchronize around it. And it was this sort of like this hidden language that they had that they were all playing together. And he gave them a beat beat by beat. They were able to harmonize with one another. And you know, that, that sort of, made me think about companies that fall out of stride and out of rhythm. It, that's a big issue for companies and for leaders. For us to remember, there's a rhythm, there's a harmony that we need to maintain within the organization. And when we break it, nobody knows where to be. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, rhythm, momentum, you know, uh, being on the same page. I mean, the, you know, as a musician myself, and as, as you are too, Govind, I mean, just having that, you know, having that rhythm together because you can have a band of, you know, eight people and if they're all following the same rhythm, the same groove, it's, it's, it's beautiful music. But if you have people dragging the tempo, being out of key, out of t- it, it slowly just turns into noise, right? It's, it's terrible. So uh, it, it's a great analogy, you know, that, that to, to the music and the rhythm and momentum, the energy that it takes for a sports team or a business to continue that to work together and just bring as many people into that ecosystem as you can um, is success. Yeah, amazing. So final word, James, what do you think? Should people get out there and buy this book? No, I, I, I do, I do. I know we covered a lot of ground here, but it's, it's, um, it's, it's just a really different book. And I think that's what you and I were talking about in the beginning. We weren't too sure what to make of it. Was this a basketball? Uh, was this a basketball story? Was this a personal philosophy book? It's, and I think that you can um, bring um, any mentality to this book and find tremendous value. So, so I can see it appealing to, to business leaders, to people looking to improve their life, to people trying to get into coaching uh, at any level, whether it's sports or business or personal life, whatever. Um, there's a, a ton of value in this book. So I highly recommend it. Yeah, I, and I would, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to give it two big thumbs up as well. I'm going to, I'm going to add that that I would totally get this book. And this is not a, this is not a one and out book. This is a read it, ponder it, reread it. There was a beautiful uh, chapter in this book that made me commit to rereading the book, which was it, the whole chapter is called "Hearing the Unheard." It was chapter seven, and. You know, he tells a lot of really amazing stories in this particular one. It's very tribal. He talks, tells stories of native culture and, and all kinds of things and wolves and jungles. And, but one of the things that he talks about is transparency. 
and how transparency was the key that he didn't pretend to be a therapist he didn't pretend to be anything but he pretended he didn't he wasn't he he didn't hide the fact that he cared deeply uh about these men becoming all that they needed to be and i and i think that that was really amazing and it's that that was the thing that really stuck with me is this hearing the unheard and putting yourself in a place of so much stillness, one breath, one voice, one heart, which is what he talked about all along, all along with his team. He wanted to create one breath, one heart, one mind for their teams. I think that was really powerful for me. And I, and I think it's something that, you know, hearing that he did it gives me a little more courage to lead that way in my life, in my companies. I couldn't agree more, Kevin. Amazing. So, hey, listen, if you're listening, uh, to, to the paper napkin was a book review with James Ashcroft. I want to, let, let's, let's hear back from you, share this podcast and share this video. It's going to be on YouTube as well. Share it. Let us know that you enjoyed it and we'll do more of them. We're going to do them regularly. How regularly based on you. Thanks, James. Thank you, Gavin.